to Tuesday Horror Tales with Prago Dotto. Tonight's story is Anand Babu's Terror by Shottajit Rai. I met Anand Babu on a train to Raghunathpur where I was going on a holiday. I worked for one of the dailies in Kolkata. The pressure of work over the last few months had nearly killed me. I definitely needed a break. Besides writing being my hobby, I had ideas for a couple of short stories that needed further thought. And I needed peace and quiet to think. So I applied for 10 days leave and left with a packet of writing paper in my suitcase. There was a reason for choosing Raghunathpur. An old college mate of mine, Biren Bishash, had his ancestral home there. We were chatting in the coffee house one evening, talking of possible places where one might spend one's holiday. Upon being told that I had applied for leave, Biren promptly offered me free accommodation in Raghunathpur. I would have gone with you, he said, but you know, how tied up I am at the moment. You won't have any problem though. Bharadaj will look after you. He's worked for our family for 50 years. Our coach was packed. Onath Bundhu Mitro happened to be sitting right next to me. About 50 years of age, not very tall, hair parted in the middle, a sharp look in his eyes and an amused smile playing on his lips. But his clothes, he appeared to have dressed for a party in a play set 50 years ago. Nobody these days wore jackets like that, or such collars, or glasses, or boots. We began to chat. It turned out that he too was going to Raghunathpur. Are you also going on a holiday? I asked him. But he did not answer and seemed to grow a little pensive. Or it may be that he had failed to hear my question in the racket the train was making. The sight of Birain's house pleased me very much. It was a nice house, with a strip of land in front that had both vegetables and flowers growing in it. There were no other houses nearby. So the possibility of being disturbed by the neighbours was non-existent. Despite protests from Bharadaj, I chose the room in the attic for myself. It was an airy little room, very comfortable and totally private. I moved my things upstairs and began to unpack. It was then that I realized I had left my razor blades behind. Never mind, said Bharadaj. Kundubabu's shop is only five minutes walk from here. You'll get your billets there. I left for the shop soon after tea, at around 4 p.m. It appeared that the place was used more or less like a club. About seven middle-aged men were seated inside on wooden benches, chatting away merrily. One of them was saying rather agitatedly, Well, it's not something I have only heard about. I saw the whole thing with my own eyes. All right, so it happened 30 years ago. But that kind of thing cannot get wiped out from one's memory, can it? I shall never forget what happened, especially since Holodhar Dotto was a close friend of mine. In fact, even now I can't help feeling partly responsible for his death. I bought a packet of 7 o'clock blades, then... I began to loiter. Looking at the things, I didn't really need. The gentleman continued, Just imagine, my own friend laid a bet with me for just 10 rupees and went to spend the night in that west room. I waited for a long time the next morning for him to turn up. But when he didn't, I went with Jiten Bokshi, Kurichoran Shaha, and a few others to look for him in the Haldar mansion. And we found him in the same room, 
lying dead on the floor, stone cold, eyes open and staring at the ceiling. The naked fear I saw in those eyes could only mean one thing, I tell you. Ghosts. There was no injury on his person, no sign of snake bite or anything like that. So what else could have killed him? But a ghost, you tell me? Another five minutes in the shop gave me a rough idea of what they were talking about. There was apparently a 200-year-old mansion in the southern corner of Raghunathpur, which had once been owned by the Haldars, the local zamindars. It had lain abandoned for years. A particular room in this mansion that faced the west was supposed to be haunted. Although, in the last 30 years, no one had dared to spend a night in it after the death of Holodor Dotto, the residents of Raghunathpur still felt a certain thrill thinking of the unhappy spirit that haunted the room. The reason behind this belief was both the mysterious death of Holodor Dotto and the many instances of murders and suicides in the history of the Haldar family. Intrigued by this conversation, I came out of the shop to find Onad Bundhumitro, the gentleman I had met on the train, standing outside, a smile on his lips. Did you hear what they were saying? He asked. Yes, I couldn't help it. Do you believe in it? In what? Ghosts? Yes. Well, you see, I have heard of haunted houses often enough, but never have I met anyone who has actually stayed in one and seen anything. So I don't quite... Anad Babu's smile deepened. Would you like to see it? He said. What? That house? See. How do, how, how do you mean, see? Only from the outside. It's not very far from here, a mile at the most. If you go straight down this road, past the twin temples, and then turn right, it's only a quarter of a mile from there. The man seemed interesting. Besides, there was uh, no need to get back home quite so soon, so I left with him. The Haldar mansion was not easily visible. Most of it was covered by a thick growth of wild plants and creepers. It was only the top of the gate that towered above everything else and could be seen a good ten minutes before one reached the house. The gate was really huge. The arch over it was in shambles. A long walk led to the front veranda. A couple of statues and the remains of a fountain told us that there used to be a garden in the space between the house and the gate. The house was strangely structured. There was absolutely nothing in it that could have met even the lowest of aesthetic standards. The whole thing seemed only a shapeless heap. The last rays of the setting sun fell on its mossy walls. Onad Babu stared at it for a minute. Then he said, As far as I know, ghosts and spirits don't come out in daylight. Why don't we, he added, winking, go and take a look at that room. That west room? The one? Yes, the one in which Holodor Dotto died. The man's interest in the matter seemed a bit exaggerated. Onad Babu read my mind. I can see you're surprised. Well, I don't mind telling you the truth. The only reason behind my arrival in Raghunathpur is this house. Really? Yes, I had learnt in Calcutta that the house was haunted. I came all the way to see if I could catch a glimpse of the ghost. You asked me on the train why I was coming here. I didn't reply, which must have appeared rude. But I had decided to wait until I got to know you a little better before telling you. But why did you have to come all the way from Calcutta to chase a ghost? I'll explain that in a minute. I haven't yet told you about my profession. 
Have I? The fact is that I am an authority on ghosts and all things supernatural. I have spent the last 25 years doing research in this area. I have read everything that's ever been published on life after death. Spirits that haunt the earth, vampires, werewolves, black magic, voodoo, the lot. I had to learn seven different languages to do this. There is a Professor Norton in London who has a similar interest. I have been in correspondence with him over the last three years. My articles have been published in well-known magazines in Britain. I don't wish to sound boastful, but I think it would be fair to say that no one in this country has as much knowledge about these things as I do. He spoke very sincerely. The thought that he might be telling lies or exaggerating things did not cross my mind at all. On the contrary, I found it quite easy to believe what he told me and my respect for this man grew. After a few moments of silence, he said, I have stayed in at at least uh, 300 haunted houses all over the country. Goodness! Yes, in places like Jabbulpur, Cherapunji, Kanthi, Katwa, Chotpur, Azimganj, Hazaribagh, Shuri, Barashat and so on, many others. I have stayed in uh, at least uh, 56 dark bungalows and at least uh, 30 neel kutis. Beside these, there are about 50 haunted houses in Kolkata and its suburbs where I have spent my nights. But... Anand Babu stopped. Then he shook his head and said, The ghosts have eluded me. Perhaps uh, they like to visit only those who don't want to have anything to do with them. I have been disappointed time and again. Only once did I feel the presence of something strange in an old building in Madras, Tiruchirappalli. It used to be a club during British times. Do you know what happened? The room was dark and there was no breeze at all. Yet each time I tried to light a candle, someone or something kept snuffing it out. I had to waste 12 matchsticks. However, with the 13th, I did manage to light the candle. But as soon as it was lit, the spirit vanished. Once, in a house in Calcutta, too, I had a rather interesting experience. I was sitting in a dark room, as usual, waiting for something to happen, when I suddenly felt a mosquito bite my scalp. Quite taken aback, I felt my head and discovered that every single strand of my hair had disappeared. I was totally bald. Was it really my own head? Or had I felt someone else's? But no, the mosquito bite was real enough. I switched on my torch quickly and peered into the mirror. All my hair was intact. There was no sign of baldness. These were the only two slightly queer experiences I have had in all these years. I had given up all hope of finding anything anywhere. But recently I happened to read an old magazine about this house in Raghunathpur. So I thought I'd come and try my luck for the last time. We had reached the front door. Onath Babu looked at his watch and said, The sun sets today at 5.31pm. It's now 515 Let's go and take a quick look before it gets dark. Perhaps his interest in the supernatural was infectious. I readily accepted his proposal. Like him, I felt eager to see the inside of the house and that room in particular. We walked in through the front door. There was a huge courtyard and what looked like a stage. It must have been used for pujas and other festivals. There was no sign now of the joy and laughter it must have witnessed. There were verandas and the courtyard to our right lay a broke palanquin and beyond it was a staircase going up. It was so dark on the staircase that Onad Babu had to take a torch out of his pocket and switch it on. 
We had to demolish an invisible wall of cobwebs to make our way. When we finally reached the first floor, I thought to myself, it wouldn't be surprising at all if this house did turn out to be haunted. We stood in the passage and made some rough calculations. The room on our left must be the famous west room. We decided. Vanad Babu said, Let's not waste any time. Come with me. There was only one thing in the passage, a grandfather clock. Its glass was broken. One of its hands was missing and the pendulum lay to one side. The door to the west room was closed. Onad Babu pushed it gently with his forefinger. A nameless fear gave me goose pimples. The door swung open. But the room revealed nothing unusual. It may have been a living room once. There was a big table in the middle with a missing top. Only the four legs stood upright. An easy chair stood near the window. Although sitting in it now would not be very easy as it had lost one of its arms and a portion of its seat. I glanced up and saw that the bits and pieces of an old-fashioned hand-pulled fan still hung from the ceiling. It didn't have any rope. The wooden bar was broken and its main body torn. Apart from these objects, the room had a shelf that must have once held rifles, a pipeless hookah, and two ordinary chairs, also with broken arms. Onad Babu appeared to be deep in thought. After a while, he said, Can you smell something? Smell what? Incense, oil, and burning flesh, all mixed together. I inhaled deeply, but could smell nothing beyond the usual musty smell that comes from a room that has been kept shut for a long time. So I said, Why, no, I don't think I can. Onad Babu did not say anything. Then, suddenly, he struck his left hand with his right and exclaimed, God, I know this smell well. There is bound to be a spirit lurking about in this house. Though whether or not he'll make an appearance remains to be seen. Let's go. Onad Babu decided to spend the following night in the Haldar mansion. On our way back, he said, I won't go tonight because tomorrow is a moonless night. The best possible time for ghosts and spirits to come out. Besides, I need a few things, which I haven't got with me today. I'll bring those tomorrow. Today, I came only to make a survey. Before we parted company near Biren's house, he lowered his voice and said, Please don't tell anyone else about my plan. From what I heard today, people here are so superstitious and easily frightened that they might actually try to stop me from going in if they came to know of my intention. And he added, Please don't mind that I didn't ask you to join me. One has to be alone, you see, for something like this. I sat down the next day to write, but could not concentrate. My mind kept going back to the west room in the mansion. God knows, what kind of experience awaited Onath Babu? I could not help feeling a little restless and anxious. I accompanied Onath Babu in the evening, right up to the gate of the Haldar mansion. He was wearing a black high-necked jacket today. From his shoulder hung a flask, and in his hand he carried the same torch he had used the day before. He took out a couple of small bottles from his pocket before going into the house. Look, he said, this one has a special oil made with my own formula. It is an excellent mosquito repellent. And this one here has carbolic acid in it. If I spread it 
in and around the room, I will be safe from snakes. He put the bottles back in his pocket, raised the torch and touched his head with it. Then he waved me a final salute and walked in, his heavy boots clicking on the gravel. I could not sleep well that night. As soon as dawn broke, I told Parataj to fill a thermos flask with enough tea for two. When the flask arrived, I left once more for the Haldar mansion. No one was about. Should I call out to Anath Babu or should I go straight up to the west room? As I stood debating, a voice said, Here, this way. Anath Babu was coming out of the little jungle of wild plants from the eastern side of the house, a neem twig in his hand. He certainly did not look like a man who might have had an unnatural or horrific experience the night before. He grinned broadly as he came closer. I had to search for about half an hour before I could find a neem tree. I prefer this to a toothbrush, you see. I felt hesitant to ask him about the previous night. I brought some tea, I said instead. Would you like some here or would we rather go home? Oh, come along, let's sit by that fountain. Onath Babu took a long sip of his tea and said, Ah, with great relish. Then he turned to me and said with a twinkle in his eye, You're dying to know what happened, aren't you? Yes. I mean, uh, yes, a little. All right, I promise to tell all. But let me tell you one thing right away. The whole expedition was highly successful. He poured himself a second mug of tea and began his tale. It was 5 p.m. when you left me here. I looked around for a bit before going into the house. One has to be careful, you know. There are times when animals and other living beings can cause more harm than ghosts. But I didn't find anything dangerous. Then I went in and looked into the rooms in the ground floor that were open. None had any furniture left. All I could find was some old rubbish in one and a few bats hanging from the ceiling in another. They didn't budge as I went in. So I came out again without disturbing them. I went upstairs at around 6.30 p.m. and began making preparations for the night. I had taken a duster with me. The first thing I did was dust that easy chair. Heaven knows how long it had lain there. The room felt stuffy. So I opened the window. The door to the passage was also left open, just in case Mr. Ghost wished to make his entry through it. Then I placed the flask and the torch on the floor and lay down on the easy chair. It was quite uncomfortable, but having spent many a night before under far more weird circumstances, I did not mind. The sun had set at 5.30. It grew dark quite soon and that smell grew stronger. I don't usually get worked up, but I must admit, last night I felt a strange excitement. Gradually, the jackals in the distance stopped their chorus and the crickets fell silent. I cannot tell when I fell asleep. I was woken by a noise. It was the noise of a clock striking midnight. A deep, yet melodious chime came from the passage. Now, fully awake, I noticed two other things. First, I was lying quite comfortably in the easy chair. The torn portion wasn't torn anymore and someone had tucked in a cushion behind my back. Secondly, a brand new fan hung over my head. A long rope from it went out to the passage and an unseen hand was pulling it gently. I was staring at these things and enjoying them thoroughly when I realized from somewhere in the moonless night that a full moon had appeared. 
The room was flooded with bright moonlight. Then the aroma of something totally unexpected hit my nostrils. I turned and found a hookah by my side. The rich smell of the best quality of tobacco filling the room. Anad Babu stopped. Then he smiled and said, Quite a pleasant situation, wouldn't you agree? I said, Yes, indeed. So you spent the rest of the night pretty comfortably, did you? At this, Anad Babu suddenly grew grave and sunk into a deep silence. I waited for him to resume speaking. But when he didn't, I turned impatient. Do you mean to say, I asked, that you really didn't have any reason to feel frightened? You didn't see a ghost after all, right? Anad Babu looked at me. But there was not even the slightest trace of smile on his lips. His voice sounded hoarse as he asked. When you went into the room the day before yesterday, did you happen to look carefully at the ceiling? No, I don't think I did. Why? There's something rather special about it. I cannot tell you the rest of my story without uh, showing it to you. Come, let's go in. We began climbing the dark staircase again. On our way to the first floor, Anand Babu said only one thing. I will not uh, have to chase ghosts again, Shitesh Babu. Never. I have finished with them. I looked at the grandfather clock in the passage. It stood just as it had done two days ago. We stopped in front of the west room. Go in, said Anand Babu. The door was closed. I pushed it open and went. Then my eyes fell on the floor and a wave of horror swept over me. Who, who was lying on the floor? Heavy boots on his feet. And whose laughter was that? Loud and ricious, coming from the passage outside, echoing through every corner of the Haldar mansion? Drowning me in it, paralyzing my senses, my mind. Could it be? I could think no more. When I opened my eyes, I found Bharuddhaj standing at the foot of my bed and Bhavatosh Mojumdar fanning me furiously. Oh, thank God you have come round, he exclaimed. If Shizu Choron hadn't seen you go into the house, Heaven knows what might have happened. Why on earth did you go there anyway? I could only mutter faintly, Last night, on earth, Babu? Bhavatush Babu cut me short. On earth, Babu, it's uh, too late now to do anything about him. Obviously, he didn't believe a word of what I said the other day. Thank God you didn't go with him to spend the night in that room. You saw what happened to him, didn't you? Exactly the same thing happened to Holodhar Dotto all those years ago, lying on the floor, cold and stiff, the same look of horror in his open eyes, staring at the ceiling. I thought quietly to myself, No, oh, He's not lying there cold and stiff. I know what's become of Onat Babu after his death. I might find him even tomorrow morning. Perhaps if I bothered to go back, there he would be, wearing a jacket and heavy boots, coming out of the jungle in the Haldar mansion, a neem twig in his hand, grinning, from year to year. That was Anad Babu's Terror by Chotojit Rai.
folks in life there are many incidents which remain completely unexplicable and perhaps these incidents these feelings and these emotions add on to the supernatural experiences